Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. Today is a conversation episode, but not with a PI, not with a copy trader, not with a YouTuber. Who else could it be? It's only one of the people behind the platform itself. Here we go. Episode 16 of Copy Traders Club and the fox is in the hen house. I cannot quite believe that so few episodes in, we're being visited by a high-level eToro delegation fronted by Sam Rudnick, head of the PI program, or to give him his official title, Investment Program Manager. Now, normally we send a limousine to pick up the guests from the local airport or a hotel nearby, but as you can probably hear, Sam, being an eToro bigwig, is arriving in style. Chopper is touching down on our landing pad, which doubles as a croquet lawn. Hi Sam, let's get inside. Oh, that's much better. Quieter in here. Sam, hello. Welcome to Copy Traders Club. Thanks a lot, Gavin. It's a pleasure to be featured on your podcast. A real honor. I've enjoyed listening um, to some of your recordings. We're well aware of the podcast. So it's a pleasure to be here. Well, on behalf of all the staff here at Copy Traders Clubhouse, we're thrilled to have eToro visiting. And they're all here to cater to your every need, Sam. Before we can relax, the entry protocol must be adhered to, even for eToro representatives. So, to clear reception, you need to answer a series of quickfire questions. Ready for those? Sure. Fire away. Username on eToro. Hornet1. Date you joined eToro. February 2013. Year of birth. 1987. Place of residence? Israel, Herzliya, Israel. Profession? Investment management or investment programs at eToro. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. Uh, we hope to build the largest investment network in, in the world and to provide a marketplace of talented and experienced investors for everyone to invest in. Name one of your investing heroes. Howard Marks. Name one of your favorite investing books. Irrational Exuberance by Robert Schiller. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed into the VIP section here at the clubhouse, into the splendid Copy Traders Lounge. Sam Rudnick. Investment Program Manager at eToro. Are you ready for this magical transition? Sure. I'm ready. (laughs) So here we are now in the Copy Traders Lounge, Sam. Why don't we get it? started with you giving us a bit of background as to how you got involved in eToro. Sure. So I initially joined eToro at the beginning of 2013. I had a passion for finance or fintech. Um, I was invited to come to an interview at eToro and was asked to initially work for the CEO as his business assistant, the chief investment officer, Yoni Asia, and founder. He has a glowing reputation. When I spoke to people about this potential uh, job, I was told that it would be amazing to work under him. It was. I worked under him for two years. And in 2015, I went to then work overseeing the Popper Investor Program. Um, and ever, and I've become, and I've overseen the Popper Investor Program and also for a time also building up the Toro Copy Portfolio offering. 
which at the time was just starting out. So I expanded the portfolios there. And now I oversee the solely focused on overseeing the Popper Investor Program. Um, I sit in the trading department at eToro within eToro's investment office in terms of the organizational structure. The Pop Investor Program is perceived as one of our investment, part of our investment offering. Offering, so it sits in the investment office. So I oversee every aspect of the program, which involves operations, marketing, risk, performance, every aspect from, from A to Z. And so I work with the whole company. What year did you join? At uh, the beginning of 2013. And how big an organization was eToro then compared to now? So the headcount of the company back then was, um, I think, between 100, just uh, over 150 employees when I joined. Today, I think there's 1,300 employees. Probably when this goes live, the number may have changed. I'm not too sure. So the company has grown substantially since. And when I initially joined to oversee the Pop Investor Program, copy trading in the product was very different then to what it is today. And the aim back then was to build it into an, an investment management offering to disrupt the traditional investment management, provide retail clients access to talented and unique investment strategies. I think we're there today. There's a lot more we can do, uh, but I think we're on the right journey um, and we're in the right place. So on that point, was there a eureka moment when somebody said, first mentioned the idea of copy trading? Or how did that come about? So that was before I joined the company. But what I thought was, what I believe is that uh, eToro believes in the democratization of finance. It believes in open, opening global markets for everyone to invest in a simple and transparent manner. The, the belief in openness and transparency is part of eToro's core goals. So in 2010, you could start to follow other people's portfolios and see their portfolios. Then. The CEO and uh, the head of trading and management decided, why don't we allow people to actually copy the trades of the people they're following? And then it evolved from there, being able to copy the trades of others to understand that this can actually disrupt traditional investor, people investing investing in, in, in money managers. What were the circumstances of that first thought? Was it in a board meeting? Or, you know, is it the stuff of Hollywood legend? Can we- a couple of people out fishing one day and it dawned on them. And I, I don't know, but I believe it evolved, it evolved over time through analyzing data and looking at data. We also did academic research to see that people could perform better when they copy the trades of others. And people, when they trade on their own, were also losing money. Um, and therefore, we wanted to improve the client experience. Retail investors, when they go into the markets, they tend to struggle. So why can't they learn from others and copy other trades? That was, that was sort of the, the, the reasoning behind that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's a genius thought whenever it was had. I'd, I'd love to know the exact circumstances. Maybe we'll get to that. I think those are great questions. And I think because things have evolved so much over time, I think uh, maybe us employees should ask more of these questions internally and find out what really, yeah, who was the person who really, I think it, m- most of the, what we've implemented in Innovation eToro has, has happened a little gradually over specific thought processes and, and data, but I'm interested to know what was the spark or what was the trigger or who said what when. Well, as you say, if it's an evolving thing, it could be just a series of incremental steps and it's difficult to pinpoint the exact moment when what we know as copy trading was born. Yeah. So, so following someone on eToro um, was in existence before then, being able and uh, and viewing the strategies of others. So, I suppose it became the natural evolution was to copy someone, copy their traits. Okay. So you mentioned Yanni there, and how much you enjoyed working under him. I have a question here about whether Yanni's smiley boyish exterior belies a hard-assed, steely-eyed, ruthless entrepreneur. I see him on Bloomberg and places like that. You know, he's being interviewed, and he's, he's very good PR for eToro, you know, smiling away and wearing his I Love Stocks t-shirt, coming across as a very open and likable 
sort of guy in a way that it's fair to say some comparable CEOs don't. So, you know, I just wonder when the camera stops rolling, does it, does the smile fade and he goes back to being a ruthless entrepreneur? So Yoni's uh, works, uh, he doesn't stop working. He has five children. Um, I don't understand how he manages to balance balance the books, but he but he's able to. And he's just absolutely passionate, absolutely passionate about Itori's vision and mission and having Itoro disrupt the traditional world of finance and um, allow people to invest in a simple and transparent manner. He's very passionate. He's very idealistic and he's extremely, yeah, very, very serious, but he still has the, the same smile in the office as you see on the, uh, on Bloomberg. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that's uh, the culture that's being created at Itoro. Yeah. But, uh, because he's, because he's so passionate and works so hard and won't stop uh, at anything, it's then created that culture you know, at Itoro for, for other people to be inspired by that and, and do the same. Well, obviously, I look forward to sending a limo to Itoro Towers one day to pick Yanni up for a visit to the clubhouse. Um, I'll make sure security is stepped up and there's no other functions going on that day. So you can pass that on to him. This sounds good. He's, he's very happy to interact with clients and listen. Uh, so, no, no, yeah, so he'll be, he'll be delighted. Okay, let me ask you a question from the book, The Art of People. Can you pick a number between one and ten? Seven. If you weren't doing what you're doing today, what would you be doing and why? Uh, that, that's a great question. I, th- I think it would be also within the investment sort of management space. Tor is very unique, so there is no sort of comparison to what I would be doing today somewhere else. But I think it would be in the investment Invet, either managing investments myself, or I think that's what, what I would be doing if I wasn't doing what I'm doing today. Yes, I had some limited interaction with Jay Nemesis not long ago, and I told him you were coming on, and he said that you're quite a knowledgeable investor in your own right. He remembers having these deep and meaningful conversations with you back in 2017 about CRISPR technology and vertical farming and various other futuristic things? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I think I do have an interest in technology and innovation. I'm not too sure whether I would apply that to investing, actually, um, myself. I would have to, um, but I have a, working at eToro, I have a very, I've, I've, well, before I started working at eToro, and that's probably why I was interested to work at eToro, is that I have a, a genuine, I suppose, hobby or interest in innovation and technology and emerging trends um, and therefore eToro I felt was a leader in that trend and well it's not a trend a leader in, in the future of finance and that's what attracted me to come and, and work at eToro and I think that's what attracts a lot of people to, to work at eToro and maybe even attracts many of our clients to join eToro to be a part of this journey. <laughs> So you touched on the PI program there, Sam. How could you articulate briefly what the overarching vision is for the PI program on eToro? So the Pop Investor Program's vision is to build a marketplace, uh, glo- the largest marketplace in the world of talented and experienced investment managers and investment strategies for everyone to choose and pick from. And your role is to oversee all the PIs on the platform to make sure they're behaving correctly, to make sure they get promoted at the right stage. I mean, there's many aspects to it. It's to make sure that the program performs effectively in terms of provide the clients the right expectations, to make sure that we have the, the quality of the program is strong and we have a good offering for our clients to widen and expand the offering, to make sure that the popular investors are satisfied and retained, that we grow the number of popular investors, and to ensure that it provides a strong offering for the business for eToro, 
copy trading, in order for copy trading to be successful, we need a strong popular investor program. Yeah, absolutely. Do you see copy trading and therefore the PI program as the key driver for the future of eToro? It's the key differentiator. I'm not too sure whether it's the key driver. I think the key driver is uh, for eToro being an all-in-one uh, an all-in-one package for someone that they'll have all their financial, um, I suppose the dream, the vision is that all their, they'll manage all their money or sub- not all their money, but a substantial portion of their money on eToro. And therefore some would be, would be allocated to copy trading. Someone, some would be allocated to our portfolios. Someone would be allocated to maybe manual positions that someone wished to hold. Um, and other products that we may wish to offer in, in, in the future, an all-in-one product. So when an investor becomes a PI, they enter into an agreement with eToro. Is that agreement public knowledge? Is it somewhere on the site to see what the terms are of, of the relationship? Sure. When you click on the apply button to join the program, then there's the terms and conditions that you need to click on. And within the terms and conditions, it explains all the rules and regulations and guidelines of the program. Uh, So you can you can see that on the it's on the Popular Investor site page once you click on the apply button. I know you know Andrew Haddon, aka Felix Falix. One of his hopes for the future is that it, it should become harder to become a PI. I imagine that will happen as the volume of users rises. If, is that true? And if so, what elements will factor into the decision making? A longer period, a better record, ability to control risk, even evidence of good communication, even in a vacuum. I'm sure all these things could factor into the decision as to whether someone should become a PI or not. Sure, absolutely. I think it's um, about us being able to provide more robust screening. Um, and being able to do quick quick due diligence as well. So that's it's, um, it is fairly hard to be a popular investor today. To give an idea in terms of percentages of those that apply on a weekly basis and those that get uh, those that get accepted. So just to give an idea, is we may have well over one thousand or two thousand applications on a weekly basis, and we'll then we have a screener and that then reduces it to a short list of a few dozen. Then we will even check those few dozen on an individual basis. And then within those few dozen, maybe only a third of those get accepted. So we're talking here about uh, less than obviously 1% of, a- of applicants uh, become a popular investor on a weekly basis, far less than that. Uh, so it is fairly hard already today. But I think it is about, we are looking at different types of criteria um, but it's about making sure that that criteria is clear and automated um, and clear to the client so that they don't feel disappointed or confused. So it's also providing the client the right the right experience. And we are building screeners and more advanced due diligence more adv- um, in, or- in order for us to be able to have more information when the popular investor applies today. So that system and various other systems are constantly evolving and improving? Yeah, absolutely. And we plan in the next few months to make more changes to that, We've, uh, which will only probably be seen if you were to apply for the program. It won't be physically, it might not be seen by, by clients. I think you'll see the quality of the pop investor today, I think is very impressive. We have many who are uh, constantly beating the markets um, with a very strong sharp ratio, which we're very proud of. And of course, you're always going to have any investors who, for whatever reason, over the past 12 months, eight or 18 months, their their performance has been stagnant or not performing to their expectation. We are happy with the quality, but we wish to improve improve the quality. So I think it's uh, you will you will see some changes. I'm sure you're aware that at the end of the year. Elite and elite pro popular investors need to obtain certification. Many of them already have certifications elsewhere, but they need to receive certification from the Chartered Institute of Securities Investment. I think this also sets the tone for someone who joins the program initially to know that 
they have a ceiling of how far they can really grow in the program so that therefore they might not apply to the program if they know that there are more hoops that they need to get through in order to get to the higher tiers. Yeah, so unless they're prepared to go the whole way. Absolutely. And we will be making it in order to move up to the second tier, which is the tier to be paid, there may be more requirements there as well. So we plan to do that as well this year. Someone's not going to apply if they're just going to sit there and not be paid in the program. Uh, so it's it's more a question of setting expectations so that and the application process will be a lot more thorough. So that someone who eventually has gone through the application process and applied for the program is going to be more committed and be far more aware of, let's say, the rules and regulations and guidelines and expectations on our end. And that's how we also believe will improve the quality of the program. The term popular investor, we had a preliminary chat a while back and you suggested that perhaps some of the terminology might be up for review. Can I make the case for the term popular investor? Sure, go for it. (laughs) Okay, I have heard that term sort of be joked about on YouTube as sounding like it's a bit high school, but I think it's the perfect term if eToro own it and define it and repeat the reasons why it's a perfect term. Popular as in of the people, by the people, and for the people. Of the people, eToro is a meritocracy where anyone with the intelligence and talent can rise from the crowd to become a popular investor. They don't have to be born into wealth or have been to the best schools. In fact, some of the best PIs are regular people who through this platform have realized their fullest potential. They are of the people. By the people. It's the people who vote with their money that determines the success or otherwise of PIs. Those with great results who look after their copiers, think of their needs and communicate clearly with them, are elevated to the highest levels by the people. Those that fall short lose the people's support and drop down the rankings. So it's a true democracy. It's by the people. And for the people... There are many regular investors on eToro who are doing it for themselves, and that's fine. Then there are the popular investors who do it for themselves and for their copiers. They're investing for the people. Popular investors know that their actions affect thousands of lives and livelihoods, and the satisfaction that the successful PIs get from knowing how much their skills can help regular people seems to be tangible. Not only are they growing their own wealth, but they're helping others to grow theirs. They're investing for the people. So I put it to you, popular investors should not be touched as a term. That sounds great. If you were to think of another term, or have you thought of other terms, Gavin, out of interest? Not for popular investor. I was thinking about the other term, which might be up for grabs, which is copy trading. And I will make another similarly impassioned plea for that to remain because the other terms I came up with weren't great. What about copy people? For the popular investor? Oh, for copying, copy trading. Uh, Well, we can can talk about copy trading later on when we get into the copy trading section. Okay, sure, sure. Are you thinking of other terms for popular investor? Um, We're not necessarily thinking of other terms, just from a professional standpoint, we always do a, or every couple of years, we do a brand review of the program, we review the terminology we use with our product marketing and creative teams, just want to make sure that we're, the terminology and the way we're describing the program from a brand perspective, whether it's correct or not. So we are in, in the, going through a review right now, so that feedback is very helpful. I don't know whether we have any intention to change the name or not, but we obviously are just reviewing the name, how we describe the program, the name of the program, the name of the tiers in the program. Um, so that's just some, so we're going through a review currently. If you do see any changes in the future, in the future, that's why. And if you don't see any changes because of the feedback you've given now, Gavin. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, speaking of changes, is the uh, PI minimum equity amount something? that is always under scrutiny and 
always has the potential to change because that's a bit of a balancing act, isn't it? Between you want to encourage people to fulfill their potential, but you also don't want jokers managing too much money and not having any skin in the game. Absolutely. So how, how do you deal with that? Skin in the game is critical uh, to work your way through the tiers. You need to, at the end of the day, have more and more skin in the game. We do review and we have increased the minimum equity for some of the tiers over time. It's just a question of not doing it too much um, because we don't want to inconvenience our clients. And we also can end up inconvenience the copiers because then we put pressure on someone to make a deposit. Then the copiers may need to add funds or the other way around or the pop investor may wish to rebalance because of that. So we're a little bit sent while ideally, you know, we would want to increase the skin in the game for every tier. It's also a balancing act of trying to have, make sure the barriers to entry and go th- grow through the program are suitable, especially also for different regions. Let's say $5,000 in a, uh, to a particular demographic from a t- particular region may be a substantial income and that person may be investing quite a significant percentage of their liquid assets. Whereas in another country in the world where an income is far higher, that may be fairly low. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a, we need to find the balancing act that works globally. Um, and, and it is under scrutiny, of course, uh, as well. Um, so for instance, uh, a student, let's say someone who's, who's come out with a master's degree and for the last four or five years has been investing in the capital markets and think they have a u- unique strategy, they may not have a substantial income, but they are starting to work their way through the program. So we would want to have that person join the program and start to build up their reputation. Um, and we wouldn't want to maybe lose out on a talented popper investor like that. So that's a good example as well of maybe where um, not a very high equity, where the high equity could remove that type of, uh, investor. So this is something to something. This is all these factors we need to consider. Yeah, and eToro is very popular in various countries. Like it's very big in the Philippines, it seems. And you know, if you're a a wanna BPI in the Philippines, obviously you're going to have a harder job, probably getting the funds together compared to someone who lives in Switzerland, for example, just because of the economics of the two situations. Absolutely. We have very large clientele in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian clients love to copy. We have a lot of popular investors from Southeast Asia. So that's a good example. I, I, I haven't done the market research to understand the income levels of these demographics. But as you quite rightly point out, Gavin, um, there is big discrepancies. So while it may seem that a client from this region it may appear he doesn't have a lot of skin in the game, but he may have a substantial skin in the game because, you know, for him it's far higher than, or it might be exactly the same as someone from Switzerland proportionally, relatively speaking. Hope you're enjoying today's show. I'm sure you've subscribed already. If you are a successful copy trader, happy to share what you've learned, there's no need to have a public profile get in touch. The bigger the club, the better for you. So tell people on eToro about this show. Ask your PIs to come on. That way you will get to know them better. We build this club together. So let's talk about copy trading specifically. This is the Copy Traders Club, after all. I was wondering how many users are there who copy trade in some form. I saw Yanni saying on his recent Seeking Alpha video that there are hundreds of thousands of people copying. Can you be any more specific on that, or is that not information to be specified? Yeah, so this information I can't specify because now we're a public company and got to wait till we re- we 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 report these numbers. I'm not too sure if we are or not in our investor relation um, reports. So I apologize about that. When we were a private company, my answer would be I can't tell you because we're a private company. And now that we're a public company, my answer is you need to wait till we make this information public. <laughs> right. 
Okay. Well, how about, how about this then? When was copy trading introduced and how long is the longest copy trader's track record? Um, in terms of someone who's copying rather than the popular investor? Yes. I don't know, but it would be from 2012, uh, I think, when we introduced copy trading. We still have popular investors in the program from 2013 as well, which is exciting. We've been trading since 2013. Well, I would love to talk to the longest serving copy trader, if that's information within your gift in some way. I think that's a great idea. Um, I think I'll discuss it with our PR team as well. Speaking of your PR team, here's a, an associated question with that. Why is evidence of copy trader success absent from your marketing? Like I see invest like a Steve and all the rest of it. But how about this is Steve and he made X percent last year and he's been copy trading for three years and he bought a boat in the middle of last year and he doesn't know much about stocks, but he knows how to put together a team of PIs. That's a good question. Um, I think probably the first reason is maybe compliance. We can only talk about three, five years of history um, when it comes to statistics and performance. Um, so therefore, we can't you know, specify this person's been copying for a year or two years. I don't think we can relate as well to um, individual performance, like real individual performance, because that might be revealing private information. But um, we do. But if this Steve was happy to come forward and be the face of copy trading? Uh, sure. A success story or a bunch of them? Yeah, so let's, yeah, so I think we should maybe we can find some long-standing success stories um, and see if they feel comfortable to discuss. Um, we to discuss. I mean, it is sensitive, of course, uh, approaching our clients and asking them, well, away from copy trading, someone who's manually trading on eToro, invested in, in a stock or Bitcoin or whatever and made great returns over four or five years. We also don't reveal that because it's revealing personal, private, sort of strategies and information. And these people have not disclosed that they want us to talk about them. It's an interesting idea though. You can discuss it with, a, with our um, PR and communication team if this is possible. Well, one of the ideas behind this podcast is to sort of gather in copy traders to exchange ideas. And, you know, if it ever happens that I do gather in people who've got long periods of success, I certainly want to talk to them. Sure. And, uh, if they would be up for it, then uh, that might be something worth considering in the future. Of course, we have a large pool of clients to, to look at. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Maybe this public call will cause some to come forward. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I do have dozens of listeners at yeah. the moment. So <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure they'll come thronging. Okay. So copy trading as a term is, again, one that I think eToro should own and define and stick to their guns. It's already become very widespread for a start. And it sounds better than anything I could think of, like money mirroring or some other alternative copy people you mentioned. But I think the key again is just in defining it. And here's another little tirade of mine. Copy signifies the passive element and trading the active element. And copy trading exists in the hitherto undiscovered land between active and passive investing. Yes, you're outsourcing the buying and selling and the arduous time-consuming stock research and analysis. However, you still retain control over every single trade and can close anyone whenever you wish. You also should do the work to assemble your PI team according to your risk-reward ratio, monitor their performance, Keep in touch with your PIs and their strategy. You can add and remove different styles of popular investors as you choose. So copy trading can, in its simplest form, be passive, if that's what you want. Most, however, will choose to be active managers of their passive copy trading portfolio, managing their own wealth, but harnessing the skills of proven successful investors. That's why I <laughs> am behind the term copy trading. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. I also don't want to have to change my podcast name. Sure. <laughs> of course. That's another reason. I don't think we have plans to change the word copy trading. 
I just think it's more about describing it correctly. And I think what you just described is how people use our product and therefore copy trading is the most accurate way to describe that. Um, obviously, there's debates internally at Etora and maybe externally about copy trading can maybe give off the impression that you're copying the trades of a of a specific user. But maybe at the end of the day, as you describe, you're passively investing in someone and copy trade is just a mechanism in order to do that, in order to create your people based portfolio or fund of funds, so to speak, or they're not funds. Uh, that's a disclaimer to anyone from compliance, but uh, just uh, um, but just in, a, in, in, t- in terms of a similar sort of activity or portfolio. So I suppose it's, it's how you use that product, how you use copy trading will define whether that term is suitable, suitable for you. I, I agree, though, that um, that's why we came up with the term initially, and it's unique to eToro. Is there a head of copy trading? You're the head of PIs, so you think about PIs all the time. Who's thinking about the copy trader all the time? So we have different hats for that. We have a chief investment officer who, who I report to, and he oversees all of eToro's investment offering, um, which copy trading would sit in. There is aspects of copy trading that sit under me, which is the copy trader experience in regards to the popular investors. So we always are monitoring how our copy traders are it how the copying works when it comes to the popular investors. And we have, of course, a trading, a trading uh, product trading manager who oversees copy trading. And we have a product and R and D team that, and trading team that are looking at copy trading. So there's different teams and different uh, departments that have different responsibilities within copy trading because it's such, because it's suppose covers all aspects of the company. And that's, such an integral part of eToro. Let's talk about what happens after you sign up to eToro. And I mentioned this in a previous episode. I I don't know if you heard it, but yeah, so I signed up for these two programs. One was to become a copy trader on eToro. The other was to become a podcaster. And I knew nothing about either world beforehand. With eToro, I signed up. I went through all the clearance Hoops, sending in all my documentation, getting verified, funding the account. And that was fine. It all went without any trouble. But when I compare it to what I got from Buzzsprout, there is quite a difference. With Buzzsprout, I signed up as a freebie user. I only ever intended to use the free version of their product. And no sooner had I signed up than I received welcome emails, which is a common enough thing. But in the welcome emails, there was a nicely presented greeting, followed by links to where to get started. And when I clicked on the link, it was a series of welcome videos. And each video addressed a specific topic in order that they know each new user needs to understand in that order. So the very first video was, so you want to make a podcast, what's it going to be about? Here, Here's a good way to brainstorm ideas. And then the second is, what sort of podcast is it going to be? Is it going to be multiple people sitting around the table? Is it going to be a monologue? Is it going to be interviews? And all these various points about the different elements that might be involved in your podcast, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, it's, it's a real step-by-step guide. And you can watch them as slowly or as quickly as you want. I watched a couple of days, maybe two or three a day for about a week. But the point is I learned in a very friendly, bite-sized manner how to deal with all the various hurdles in my way to become a podcaster. But I didn't have any of that with eToro. With eToro, you sign up. And you're in, but there's no handholding. There's no guided tour. I mean, I know there's a guide on the site and I did use that, but it's not quite the same as having a couple of friendly, young, fresh faced presenters answering every question you've got, some that you didn't even know you had and leaving you at the end of the video series, feeling very well equipped 
to be able to do everything you want to do on that platform. Can you tell me what eToro plans to do to improve first impression customer service? Because after all, that's what's going to affect the key metric of the ratio of registered users to funded accounts. Don't you think eToro could do more for someone when they sign up? Absolutely. And I don't think it's just a question of conversion from a registered client to a depositing client. It's also a way of retaining someone once they've deposited and managing their expectations. Um, So education, we understand, is key and something that we need to work on. I think our CEO mentioned it in in a video recording he may have done with the the NASDAQ. I can't can't recall which media. We see that educating our clients is very important. You mentioned about Buzzsprout, Gavin, and your experience on Buzzsprout, and it seems ideal of what we should be creating at at eToro. And I know that there are plans to improve the automation communication cycle and client journey uh, once someone signs up to the platform. Um, And so it's a you know, it's a question of us, I suppose, over time, building more and more educational content once a client joins, explaining to them what they need to, you know, what, what they need to do or, or, you know, how they can trade and invest. I even have ideas for the two people that should present it, but uh, that's probably for another day. In addition to what we may have discussed here, there's a few ideas that have come up in the first few episodes of the show. Maybe rather than debating them all at length, we could try to categorize them via your answers into number one, it's on our radar. Number two, that won't happen because. And number three, never thought of that. Okay? Sure. The way the risk score is presented, it shows average risk as the main thing, with max risk presented as an additional little bit of info in the form of a line. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Three, never thought of that, but sounds very interesting. In one of my recent interviews uh, with Elite Vol, the risk score came up and he was only interested in discussing max risk. What is risk, if not the maximum amount of risk? The analogy being, if you go on a cliff path, it doesn't matter what the average distance of the path is to the edge of the sheer drop. What matters is the point where it's right on the edge. That's the most dangerous moment on the walk. Therefore, that's the max risk, and max risk should be the the key element. So if max risk was color-coded as a bar, with a line indicating average risk, I think that might be a a better indication for people. Yeah, it is interesting. The way the stats, it shows the monthly stat, P&L. So we're showing the monthly average risk. So the line is the highest maximum risk that month of a a day, a day where you hit the highest maximum risk. We do show in the Discover tool, as you're aware, the highest average monthly risk over the previous 12 months. But maybe we can look to change that to the highest average daily, the day with the highest risk. Take the maximum risk score, as you're suggesting, which is an interesting idea. Next one. Given the open, transparent nature of eToro, why can we not see the amount each PI has invested? I think you've already answered this in the form of the privacy issue. Yeah, that can't happen because they are clients at the end of the day in this private information, GDPR. Okay. Why can we not see on their bar chart the date they became a PI, e.g. one month is color-coded to indicate that? Never thought about that. Sounds very interesting. Are PIs required to inform copiers when they add funds? Um, we do tell them there and we provide them a template of what they should write. Um, those are, this is for champion pop investors and above someone who has a small amount of copiers. We tend to not aggressively enforce that. We provide them a template of what they should write on the feed and provide expectations and educate copiers on what they should do. And we also educate the pop investor on what scenarios 
they can decide upon as well in order to make their copiers have a good experience. Here's another idea from Felix Felix videos. Read the bar chart. Why can we not see on their bar chart when they added funds and how much, at least in percentage terms? If you can't say the precise amount, would you be able to say the percentage terms? Because there's plenty of room for a PI to add funds to massage their stats. Um, that is an interesting point. I've yet to see a popular investor able to manipulate their stats via adding funds. I know it can affect the PNL, um, but um, we have looked into some case studies or examples, but I've yet to see someone who's able to do that on a consistent long-term basis and gain copiers and gain assets under management. But it is true that if you add funds during a month, it affects that monthly result. It can. I mean, adding, adding funds can negatively affect your stats, probably more like, more so than positively affect your stats. I suppose it depends upon, though, on your current positions, whether they're in profit or in loss. The second part that was in uh, Andrew's videos, the annual figures, could they come with an asterisk that indicates the return if deposits are factored in? We, we could add that. Um, oh, I don't know whether we could add that or not. It's an interesting point. Industry standard, though, you still take into account when reviewing a fund or other investments, uh, redemptions and withdrawals, and when investors have added funds, the people managing the funds. So I, it doesn't, it, it's not going to, though, dramatically. I don't think it's going to dramatically impact the PL at the end of the year, though, uh, whether someone is, is adding or removing funds. I've yet to see an example of how someone's manipulated the stats, but I'll be happy to look at and review any pop investors that, that may be accused of doing that, of course. So if you've got any examples, feel free to share offline. <laughs> Are there any plans to extend the 12-month period for charts, trades, and risk score, etc.? cetera? Um, so we, show, we sometimes show two-year performance in the Discover tool. You may see occasionally we show two years there. I think it would be nice to show a longer. I don't know whether there are plans or not. I don't know is the answer, but that's a good suggestion. Here's an idea from Moth Copy Trading. The minimum copy amount could be a stat that appears on each PI's profile without the copier having to work it out. So when you click on copy and then you move the copy amount, it should show you how the average amount per trade you'll be copying with with that amount. Um, so that does that may be an indicator as well. But does that tell you the minimum copy amount to cover all positions? It doesn't necessarily tell me the minimum copy amount to cover all positions, but normally you can't copy with, you can't bring it down if you're not going to open all the positions. You can't bring the minimum copy. Although it's not explicit. It can be more explicit for sure. Communications can be a little bit better. How about a checkbox on every profile indicating whether you do or do not wish to be copyable? For example, I'm copyable right now. And in my conversation with C6 Steve from Moth Copy Trading, he was saying he got a couple of people copying him based on his YouTube channel. And suddenly he was they were factoring into his thoughts. I don't want anyone else factoring into my thoughts. You know, and I'm not looking for copiers. Surely I could be able to click something and say, just, I'm uncopyable. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If you go private, obviously you cannot be copied, but you want to be public. Mm. This is a good suggestion, something to can share with various teams. Here's something that came up in the conversation with Mick Mullins, Logic Fool. The idea is a place to store meaningful content created by PI so that it doesn't just get lost in the feed. I think he means something like an article folder where PIs can copy their more in-depth posts and perhaps about market outlook or individual stocks or sectors and tag them accordingly so that there could be therefore site-wide folders where all these articles are categorized and can be found using those tags to search, which is an idea which then could be built out into my thought that the pick and the bio section and the pinned post for PIs is quite a limited amount of information. And there could be another 
section in that bar, another link to say folder, PI folder or something, which could be built out with multiple photos, an intro video, FAQs that they get frequently asked, an article section, press coverage, a link to their Copy Traders Club appearance, of course, featured very prominently, and uh, you know their website and social media links, all that stuff could be stored in one spot specific to PIs. Sure, I'm aware of that, definitely aware of that, and that's something that we discuss internally. The solutions aren't necessarily what you described, but we're aware of that. Okay. Okay, well, before we wrap it up here, Sam, uh, have you have you any other messages you want to convey to the listener, to the copy traders out there? I would just like to say thanks so much for being so engaged and providing us such great feedback and building this podcast. It's really helpful for employees and people who are using the platform. They require education, uh, assistance, and help. We use the Itari platform, Itari staff, we all do. So we enjoy using the platform. And so it's also beneficial for us to have access to these podcasts. And we share them around internally. Hey, listen to this. Listen to what this person has to say about this popular investor or copy trading. So it's, it's a great feedback loop that we really appreciate. And I'm sure many more people will appreciate over time. Okay. And to where should I send my invoice for all this wonderful feedback, <laughs> all these great ideas? <laughs> no, free of charge. Free of charge. Please, please send, please send Gavin any feedback and ideas. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, it makes for interesting conversations among copy traders. And people come up with these things. All right, well, Sam, look, I know you have to go. Thank you so much for doing this. I hope you're the first of many eToro representatives. Maybe you could give some thought to who else could come on the show, suggest it to them. You let me know the type of person you want to speak to, the questions you want asked, and I'll be happy to make the introduction. Okay, fantastic. Thanks a lot, Sam. Thanks so much, Gavin. Appreciate it. Bye. Great to have contact with eToro. As you may have sensed, Sam was a little pressed for time, so a number of things didn't quite make it into the chat. I had intended to discuss the risk score more fully. A suggestion that was omitted was for a copy trader to be able to see at a glance the total number of unique positions in their portfolio. And I was hoping for more of a discussion about eToro into the future, in the US and so on. However, time was against us. Hopefully there will be further opportunities. Also, I'm sorry there were some audio issues on both sides, which fell short of the usual impeccable standards to which you have become accustomed, dear listener. That's it from me. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously, anything you hear in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just an air chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth. <laughs>